I'm Julie Arliss from Academy Conferences. I'm here at the University of Aberdeen with Professor John Swinton. And um, I've, got a, I've got an evil question for My you, John. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about the whole um, growing, um, gr growing movement towards acceptance of assisted dying. Um, and I think if I were to talk to my students about assisted dying, they would they would be almost all in favour of it. Yeah. I think it's um, a humane approach yeah. to to the very sick and those who are dying. Um, but what I'd like to ask you is how we might think about this question. Um, we uh, is, have you got an ethical framework that's your favourite that you think works in this situation? Yeah. Um, or, or should we just go for sort of crowd sourcing yeah. of an answer? You know, we've had a, a vote on Brexit. Why not have a vote on That's assisted right. suicide and just go and for? Yeah. yeah, is this something that the public should be allowed to choose? Sure. Or, yeah. or, or is there, or, or are there other ways of thinking about this decision-making process yeah. that might that might that might better serve us? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a number of ways that we could approach that. And if I can think of two, right? So I have a colleague in, uh, who works in Sloan Kettering University uh, Hospital in New York, right? and he's a psychotherapist, but he's also a, an end-of-life care doctor. So he brings these two things together. And one of the things that struck him, his name is William Breitbart. One of the things that struck him was the number of people who were coming to the end of their life who were asking for physician-assisted suicide. Right now, so in America. Uh, end of life care, you have to have a doctor that says you're going to die within eight weeks, right? So you're right, right, right at the end of your life care. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he wasn't quite sure to what to do with that. So he reflected on the standard ethical arguments around whether it's a good thing, whether it's a bad thing. Um, but he decided to, to use his psychotherapeutic perspective in a slightly different way. And so what he did is he discovered that people would ask for assisted, a physician assisted suicide because they couldn't find any meaning in their life, mm -hmm. no purpose. Uh, no sense of uh, the future, that they were a burden on society mm -hmm. and that they actually were beginning to lose their identity. So all these kind of things are, that we assume to be central to personhood. And so what he did was he set up meaning centres, um, psychotherapeutic groups for people in this space here. And so they gathered over eight meetings, I think it was, and they began to discuss these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and all these deep issues under the broad banner of spirituality, that it's not a religious spirituality, it's that meaning, purpose and hope and value. And what I discovered at the end of that process is that people stopped asking the question. Because they started to see that actually the experience was shared. Because loneliness is something very important at the end of your life, isn't it? And disappointment is a, these, these kind of key things. Um, but as they engaged with one another, they began to see that perhaps they weren't a burden, perhaps their family didn't love them, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, there was some purpose in their life. And so what he discovered was rather than simply um, wrestling with the ethical dilemma, mm -hmm. he put into practice a certain form of being together, a certain mode of community, mm -hmm. which changed the frame of the question yeah. and meant that people and that stopped asking the question. Um, and I think that probably before we get into the issue of actually whether or not something's good or bad, think about the alternatives. You know, think about what, what's the problem with palliative care that people are asking for mm -hmm. this particular mode mm -hmm. of uh, solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. Are there other, other possibilities? And have a practical ethical debate as mm -hmm. well as a conceptual ethical debate mm -hmm. and take seriously yeah. what a broad range of people say rather than this, a single person. And to move away from that idea of utilitarianism, but the greatest good for the good. But people, is the number is, is the, the, the principle that we work on, mm -hmm. which can easily be corrupted by uh, the economics of end life care in that yeah. sense. Well, there's another strand of that as well, another set of questions that we might want to ask. One of the interesting things about the euthanasia debate in relation, to, for example, to the way it's worked out in, in Europe, certain parts of Europe, is that some medics are beginning to encounter post traumatic stress disorder because they've been asked to do something that is completely counterintuitive, completely against their um, uh, principles, and so therefore they are really are struggling with that. So we want to think about that. What does it mean to take somebody's life? So we say physician-assisted suicide in that case. What does that mean? What do we do for you to, to go to work and kill somebody and then go off and have your, your tea break? 
And the assumption, of course, is that when you take somebody's life, it's just an easy process. You take a drink and you fall asleep. It's not like that. Yeah. It's, it's much more complicated and much more engaged. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, like, it's some interesting literature that looks at uh, survivors. Yes, I, I interviewed a doctor who, who told me this, that actually people don't often die when That's you right. give them the dose that you think should kill them. Yeah. And they're still there, and then what do you do? <laughs> give them some more? <laughs> That's right. well, precisely. And then not only that, are they kind of, you know, dealing with this end of life problem or whatever it is, mm -hmm. they also end up post traumatic stress disorder. So it's much more complicated than sitting in a room and making a decision, or sitting yeah. in Parliament and making mm -hmm. a decision, wherever that room may be. Mm -hmm. So, what about the autonomy argument? Because even, even if there are other options, if some, you know, um, and some, but someone's had, had all the palliative care and, and they've had all the counselling and they say, but you know what, it's still my life and I've had enough. Do you yeah. think that's got any weight to it? Because that tends to be a very popular argument. It's, well, it clearly has a, its weight. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. individual, we have to listen very carefully to individual yeah. and, and uh, deal with cases on an individual basis. Like. But when it comes to issues of law, it's not enough really to have an individual who wants to make a decision over anything. We, we don't do that. It's not how we make law, it's not how we make decisions, and not how we do politics. Mm -hmm. So whilst you want to take very seriously an individual's opinion, that opinion isn't necessarily mm -hmm. uh, the criterion for big political decisions. Mm -hmm. So that then raises the question if autonomy isn't going to be the, just the law, the thing that frames the law, what kind of thing might be? Yeah, I, my, my general sense would be, think about the, the way that medicine runs. But we are in a difficult position because medicine now can keep us alive in the ways that we couldn't imagine a hundred years ago. So you can basically we can live forever uh, if we're properly wired up to whatever machine it is. Which means that the meaning of death begins to shift, so now it's brain death seems to be a thing, mm -hmm. even though someday in a post uh, a vegetative state can be kept alive forever and ever. So there's all these, con these conversations. So I think what needs to be done is an, uh, uh, to make legislation, we need to leave it to people, in some senses, who have particular responsibility to make these decisions. So we hand over the responsibility to politicians to make these mm -hmm. kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. And these politicians should, in an ideal world, be uh, people who um, are able to facilitate the participation of a broad range of people mm -hmm. into the conversation mm -hmm. and then represent that broad range of people within the, in the, uh, the, a very complicated debate mm -hmm. within the uh, halls of power. Uh, got. So I think what we need to think about is um, how can we facilitate or how can we enable our politicians mm -hmm. truly to, to, to uh, facilitate participation mm -hmm. of the whole broad, uh, that broad range of people, I think. But even though, even, even if you hand it over to politicians, the pol politicians are still going to be using some fundamental principles to make these decisions. So if they are not to put autonomy on the table as the guide, then what, what kind of thing might they use? What, what else have they got? They've got liberty, they've got autonomy. Yeah. Anything else? I mean, is there anything else that you think trumps those things, or do you think ultimately they that's what they will rely upon? I think ultimately that's probably what they will rely upon because mm -hmm. these are the basic tenets of, of liberal society. Mm -hmm. So autonomy, freedom of choice, self-representation is the way that our culture functions, mm -hmm. and so therefore, certainly at the heart of that is the idea of ind individualism, where yeah. I'm an individual who is free to do whatever I want as long as I don't impinge upon anybody else's freedom. But that's a cultural view. So if you go down to other countries, other cultures, and even subcultures within our own mm -hmm. culture, people don't think that way. So the whole idea of individualism, this is based around, you know, I think, therefore I am, that kind of philosophical perspective that yeah. places intelligence above everything else. Uh, is not the way that, that many other countries mm -hmm. function. So if you go to Africa, for example, you've got that idea of uh, Ubuntu. That it's not I have to think therefore I am, it's I am because we are. Yes. And so therefore when you're thinking that way, any decision about an individual is incorporated with the, the, the understanding of, of the community and the culture. Mm -hmm. So I think once you move beyond, or once you recognise mm -hmm. that actually we are quite culturally bound in the way we think about yeah. these things, uh, and open ourselves to the possibility of, of, of genuinely engaging with other ways of looking at human beings and mm -hmm. other ways of looking at these issues, mm -hmm. then that gives us space 
for transformation or, or right. different ways of so, so as well as autonomy um, and, and self-directed um, volitional choices being valuable and liberty, liberty being valuable on the table also has to go the good of the whole. That's correct. And, and where this kind of choice yeah. might take us as a country in terms of the way we value life That's right. if, if we go down the route of assisted suicide and what we turn doctors into. That's right. If we go down the route of assisted suicide. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you, you get a fair bit of resistance from the medical profession on that basis. I mean, it's all very well to legislate and say, yeah, you know, doctors should kill people. Mm. Um, but if you're a doctor, mm. it's different. Yeah. Uh, I know Do they get an opt-out clause? Well, I think exactly. <laughs> I, I read a very interesting article by Mary Warnock. Oh, yes. That's she was mm. talking to the Presbyterian Church of Scotland's magazine, Life and Work. Mm. And in the midst of the, the, the conversation, she talked about, began to talk about dementia. Right. And what she was talking about was uh, herself to begin with. Uh, she, she, she would hate to, be, to get dementia because she'd lose herself for who she was mm. and lose her story and lose all these things that she thought about. And then she said, actually, I think you lose your personhood, which is a very unusual thing to say. Right. But then she went on to say that I, I think that the National Health Service should employ people to kill people with dementia because they're no longer persons and they're no longer able to do the things that society assumes is central to what you are as, as your personhood in that way. Right. So uh, the, and that struck me as a very startling example of something that actually all of us, many of us, have at the background of our mind uh, in relation to uh, issues of personhood, for example. That uh, you are who you are as long as you can tell your own story, but as soon as you can't tell your own story then right. you cease to be who you are. Uh, but the point would be that she says, uh, why don't you employ people to do this? <laughs> right, so she's not saying get the doctors to do this, she said, why don't you employ people to do this and you can have teams of people go around and work it out. <laughs> yes. And it, you know, I, I speak it, I, I say it like that and it sounds like a caricature, mm -hmm. but it's not but, really yeah. a caricature mm -hmm. because that, what, what's your, what are your options mm -hmm. really? Either the doctors do it or you employ somebody else mm -hmm. to do it mm -hmm. and then all the implications that come from yeah. the, the reality of having to take somebody's life. But you, you, th you, you concur with her understanding and definition of what personhood is? On I absolutely don't. You don't? No, I absolutely okay, don't. Okay, so, so tell us your take on personhood. personhood. Yeah. Well, uh, the way that she frames it is the way that many other people frame it. That mm -hmm. As long as you're able to know who you are, story, yeah. yes, remember who you were before mm -hmm. and project yourself into a possible future, then you're a person. So, a person. so it's really the philosophy of John Locke that yes. holds that. Yes. And there's an implicit, implicit Lockean philosophy that goes to French society. Um, but, th but that's basically indicates, suggests that that's a biograph autobiographical self. That all to do with being able to tell your, your story. And if you forget that story, then you cease to be yourself. So people will say things like, um, uh, she's not the person that she used to be. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because you can't tell a story. Mm -hmm. And so you, if you cre create personhood in that way, you automatically uh, 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 exclude a number of different people, including people with, with dementia. Right. However, if you, if you create personhood in terms of relationships, persons in a relationship, that I am who I am through, uh, through mm -hmm. my relationship with you, things become different. If you begin to understand memory as communal, rather than simply individual, right. it's something different happens. So for example, mm -hmm. I, uh, if, I, so interesting. if I want to, I like uh, yeah, if I want to remember anything about my childhood, I have to ask my mum. Uh, mm -hmm. Then she tells me and I believe her because she's honest. She was there too. She was there too, that's right. Um, in other words, she holds my memory for me. And so your community holds your memory. So when you forget yourself, certain thing, mm -hmm. your community holds your memory. And the real, the real question is, who will hold your memory well for you? Who do you trust mm -hmm. in that sense? And so when you begin to think in that way, personhood is something that uh, comes from your engagement with other people. It's not dependent on your biology. Mm -hmm. It's not dependent on the things that you do. It depends on who you are and the people around you. So when it comes to um, someone with very se serious Alzheimer's um, or dementia, um, they're still a person. They still retain their personal identity because the people because of the people who, who still That's love right. them and know them. That's exactly. And they right. don't lose their personal identity. No, they don't. Just because they lost their memory. What they can lose 
is uh, that sense of, of uh, their social self. Because one of the interesting things about dementia is that um, as soon as you get a diagnosis, mm -hmm. your friends drop away. Mm -hmm. the people that read the diagnosis as something profound and negative, and then they withdraw and say, I'd, I'd rather remember that person the way they were. Right. And so loneliness is a, a profound aspect of dementia. So you can lose your personhood in that sense mm -hmm. when people forget you. Right. So it's not you that forgets its problem, it's people forget you that's problem. Mm -hmm. And what's even more interesting is that uh, loneliness uh, uh, has been shown to be uh, implicated in neurological decline. So in other words, mm -hmm. if your social mm -hmm. structure comes down, then your biological structure has, yes. uh, is impacted yeah. quite significantly. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating, isn't it? That's very interesting. So there's a kind of feedback system. Yeah, yeah. John, thank you so much. That's been fascinating.